Franklin Talltree was born in Arizona in the United States, right on the Navajo Reservation. His European Action Force release, though, lists his place of birth as Naples, Italy. Franklin's parents had struck black gold, making a fortune off of oil. And when Franklin was still young, they let him take skydiving lessons. After high school, Franklin went to law school, graduating and passing the Arizona State Bar Exam to become a licensed and practicing attorney, all while jumping still headfirst into his hobby and his love of skydiving. Being a lawyer grew sour for him though and so he joined the United States Army where he was then sent to Fort Benning for infantry school. After BCT and AIT, Franklin graduated at the top of his class at 1st Battalion's Airborne School, leaning on his previous skydiving experience to succeed. In fact, he's quoted as saying, I'd rather jump out of airplanes than write legal briefs. He excelled in all three evolutions in the basic airborne course from ground to tower to jump week, then five jumps out of Herx and Globemasters at Friar Drop Zone later, including a night jump and both empty handed and with full combat loadout, Franklin earned his silver jump wings. Even though he's not a ranger, he still lives his life full of guts and danger. That said, it's more dangerous for his foes. Franklin is also trained as a helicopter shotgun rider. The door gunner specifically trained on, his file card says, a Hughes helicopter chain gun. Now, Hughes was purchased by McDonnell Douglas in 84, and that was later rolled into Boeing in the late 90s. So that means he was flying loaches, and this would be pre-160th co-opting the platform to make the Little Bird. So Franklin cut his teeth firing bungeed M60s and M134s from out the side of light observation airframes, part of the M27 armament system. If he flew low, nap of the earth, and treetop level in Vietnam, he was teamed up with the Cobras, an incredibly dangerous and hazardous operation which put him right in the range of ground fire. And I'm talking AH-1 Cobra gunships, not Cobra the enemy. All of that experience landed him a spot with the G.I. Joe team, where he debuted in Marvel Comics and Larry Hama's A Real American Hero comic book series with issue 11. In that issue, the Joe team was in the Alaskan tundra fighting with Cobra along an oil pipeline for a story called The Pipeline Ploy. At one point, right after assaulting a Cobra-controlled pumping station, Cobra on hang gliders were chasing and firing at Doc, Snake Eyes, and Snowjob who was piloting the Battle Bear snowmobile through the snowy terrain. And just as Cobra chuckled about Cobra air superiority over this AO, Airborne dropped in from above them on a Falcon glider which distracted them long enough for Snake Eyes to kill two birds with one stone, well in this case, two gliders with one RPG. The glider landed and Airborne jumped on the snowmobile with the others, introducing himself by both his code name and his birth name. Snowjob asked if Tall Tree was an Indian name, and so he replied, no, it's Native American. At the second pumping station, they ran into the still mysterious and enshrouded in shadows, Destro, the man running the pipeline ploy. Destro got away, but Doc managed to grab the antidote vials from him as Airborne and the team laughed. Next, Airborne was flying Gunner for Wild Bill and the Dragonfly as they performed exercises on a test range just before Cobra's attack on the U.S. Capitol. In the streets of Washington, D.C., CoverGirl's Wolverine was surrounded by his tanks, and so Wild Bill and Airborne swooped in with the Dragonfly for a ground attack, taking out a series of tanks in the process. Wild Bill said, How's this for the cavalry to the rescue? And Airborne said, That don't plan my reservation. Airborne was one of the team at McGuire Air Force Base who was chosen to load into a Herc to chase Destro and Scarface to a secret Cobra base in the desert 100 miles south of Tripoli, Libya. There, in a desert battle, Airborne and Wild Bill began strafing the armored Cobra columns of his tanks, but it was tricky with the dust kicked up and the Joe units intermingled among the tanks. They lowered a skyhook from the helicopter and lifted a vamp containing a captured Scarface right into the sky and disappeared over the horizon, even as Destro said aloud that Scarface was their Trojan horse infiltrating the gates of Troy. He was to destroy G.I. Joe from the inside. In the op to rescue Clutch, Airborne was above town flying a Falcon glider when he was attacked by a jetpack trooper. So Clutch flew up on his own commandeer jetpack for the assist, buzzing right by Airborne. Later, again with Wild Bill, Airborne and he landed a dragonfly near Snake Eyes in an APC. They were there to pick up the body of Quinn the mercenary and bring him out to Montauk Point for a burial ceremony. And for that quick hop, Snake Eyes took Airborne's gunner seat for the ride. Again, Airborne was with Wild Bill, but this next time, he was also with Ace. They were in the cockpit of a C-130 while Airborne was in the cargo hold area, ready to dump out a prefab fortress to the team of the Rockies, who were holding Cobra Commander prisoner. Airborne threw out a hook which caught on Leatherneck and Grunt's anchored line, which pulled the prefab fortress crate right out the back of the plane. When Storm Shadow helped Cobra Commander escape, the Joes tracked him to a lair in the Florida Everglades that they later learned belongs to Zartan. 
Airborne and the team were stationed just offshore on the Cobra's freighter called Jane, as that would be their main staging area. While Bill and Airborne were to fly tripwire and torpedo, riding on the bird's skids, and insert them inland. They'd fly in with another dragonfly flown by Zap, followed closely by Deep Six and a shark. Now feet wet, sort of, it's swampy. They dipped in under the tree canopy and dropped off their two-man recon team, although Tripwire went into the drink head first, really playing up that trip part of his name. That's right when they had a DX with Wild Weasel who was operating a water moccasin in the swampy waters below. Wild Bill lined up airborne for a kill shot, but engine trouble forced them to call off their attack, so Deep Six jumped in with his shark to hold off Wild Weasel. Wild Bill and Airborne were forced to RTB, their base being the freighter. In the hangar, Wild Bill tried to compliment Deep Six on his flying and shooting, but the ornery shy wallflower just walked right past the two of them. Wild Bill got angry and he was about to punch Deep Six, but Airborne managed to calm him down. Later, after Snake Eyes jumped out of a hurric over his cabin over the High Sierra mountain range, Hawk had Spirit and Airborne follow him out the hatch, but they were hidden in a container the whole time. And Snake Eyes wasn't supposed to know that they were along for the ride, but you know how Snake Eyes is. Spirit found Zartan's tracking device and crushed it under his boot just before he and Airborne jumped. They set up camp 10 miles away from Snake Eyes' cabin to keep watch, but that wasn't enough. Snake Eyes spotted his two teammates. Though the tracking device was destroyed, it was enough intel for Fred, Destro, and Firefly to figure out where they were. So they rolled up on the cabin with Destro firing a pistol right out the door. This was all the two Joes in the woods needed to leap into action. Spirit and Airborne ran right out of the tree line, firing at Cobra, and Airborne yelled, Hang on, Snake Eyes, the cavalry is here! And Spirit, being Native American himself, was appalled, so Airborne said, It don't make any sense to say the Indians are here. They saw Firefly on the roof, ready to drop a charge down the chimney, so Airborne said he could flank him and try to shoot him when he was at the chimney. And just as Airborne made his charge, Fred caught him in the open, and Airborne took a few AK-47 7.62 rounds in his legs, and he went down hard. He was hurt real bad. And his spirit covered his fallen teammate and stood off alone against Destro. Snake Eye's cabin exploded in a massive fireball that knocked everybody out. And amid the rubble and burned charred trees, Airborne lay face down in the snow right next to the saboteur Firefly. Softmaster showed up to render aid after Cobra escaped. Right there in the snow, they treated Airborne. Softmaster pulled two bullets out of Airborne's leg using only his hands. It's cool and all, but I doubt that was sterile, although it's better than leaving them in, though he's going to need some antibiotics really soon. So Airborne rested while Spirit and Softmaster dug through the cabin rubble to recover both Snake Eyes and Timber. Spirit went off to get firewood, and while he was gone, Fred showed up with a rifle saying he was going to kill the old man and the two wounded Joes on the ground. So Softmaster stood his ground. Fred said he had no quarrel with him. He could leave if he wanted to. He stood as a human shield in between Fred's weapon and the two downed Joes. And when Spirit got back, it was Fred who was down, a victim of his own vengeance, Softmaster said. In issue 33, following that ordeal at Snake Eye's cabin, Airborne Snake Eyes and his Uzi were in the infirmary at the pit. Airborne explained old medicine to Ripcord, enough so that he and Blowtorch would feel comfortable and could escort Spirit and his crutches to the mall to pick up some quote-unquote special herbs. In issue 40, Airborne was in a dragonfly. This time, he was piloting one right next to Wild Bill in his own. They were just off the coast of New Orleans, ready to meet a sternwheeler that was holding their air sea base. The two attack helicopters were able to lift the entire platform and fly it out into the Gulf of Mexico, where it was installed by the team. Then Airborne was back in the cargo hold of the Joe's Herc, flying low over the Gulf. The back door opened, and Airborne tossed out the drag chute into the rainy black night, and that allowed the rib to fly out the back with a ripcord rescue team inside. And then for the invasion of Springfield, Airborne flew Gunner again in the front of Wild Bill's Dragonfly, and it was Airborne who fired the opening shots of the battle. Wild Bill flew the helo down just off the tarmac of Springfield Airport, and it allowed Airborne to take out an Aspen placement with the chin turret on the Dragonfly. And so this allowed the Joe's transport planes to land and begin the invasion. Later, Airborne was with Ace at the Fort Wadsworth PX snack bar. Airborne was carrying a plate with three burgers on it. When they passed by the Migwaxer arcade game being played by someone they thought might be a new XO, but nope, it was Slipstream, a new Joe. For the invasion of Cobra Island, Airborne was on Duke's security team. They were tasked with following the weapons team and to take out the main airfield. But the security team chopper was destroyed and the team was stuck and pinned down at the hangar in the middle of the airfield, right in the middle of a pincer attack. He also happened to be on the beach after the battle drew down to help pull apart Lady J and Zerana, who kept the fight going. And he remained on active duty with the team until the first Marvel comic volume ended with issue 155. But when the G.I. Joe team was reinstated, Airborne 
re-upped, wanting to take the fight back to Serpentor and the Coil, who had now made Cobra Island their base of operations. It was also Franklin acting as an attorney who helped barrel roll during the Thomas Stahl court-martial hearing. After the big war with Serpentor, the roster was again cut down to core select few, so Airborne went back to active reserve status, although he did help them at their new base, now called The Rock, instead of The Pit. However, during World War III, the Joes had Airborne in the Sudan with a carrier strike group formed around USS Flag. And much later, now at IDW Publishing, Airborne was with Leatherneck, Rock and Roll, and Long Range near Trusha Labismia when they got a call to assist and extract Ambassador McRory who was trapped at the Embassy Building and surrounded by hostiles. At 20 AGLs above the city, they jumped, following the strobe to the roof of the compound. Leatherneck caught a gust and landed a few hundred yards away from the Embassy Building, so Airborne grabbed grabbed the strobes and flashed them at the edge of the rooftop to get Leatherneck back inside and guide him to safety. Airborne then quickly took charge of the scene and as the enemy amassed outside, Airborne said they'd have to hold out as best and as long as possible until the Sea Kings made it to them for their extraction. Airborne was the one to cover the east parapet on the roof. The Sea King was hit by an RPG and downed, so Airborne said that they now needed to figure out what plan B was. Airborne snuck through a sewer shaft to the street right under the enemy trucks. He was then able to climb onto the roof of one of the trucks and kill the occupant, slicing his throat with a knife. So as the militia snuck inside to attack them, the team snuck out and stole a couple of trucks, and they made it out with McRory sacrificing himself to save them. Then, airborne ripcord and heavy duty, Halo dropped into Shazadar to rescue three UN relief workers, but they also got lost, so Covergirl was sent in with another team to rescue all of them. Airborne and the team happened to be trapped in Shara City in Shazadar at an orphanage with the three UN relief workers. Airborne made a command decision. They had to try to get out themselves. Elves. Comms were down, they had no way to get a sit rep, no way to radio for help, and if they stayed there, they would die. Airborne and Heavy Duty stole a minibus. There was a catch though. The UN lady said that they would only go with the Joes if they also took the kids from the orphanage with them. So Airborne walked up to the driver of the bus and told him, I'm your karma, come home to roost, and fired a single shot right into his forehead, and then shot his partner in the face. It was brutal. They raced out of town in the minibus, taking gunfire from the buildings lining the streets. Airborne was hit in the shoulder just as CoverGirl's team appeared to escort them out of town. And despite Airborne's wound, he drove the bus right into the back of a low-flying C-130 for their narrow escape. In issue 263, Airborne's name was the first called out for roll call the honor ceremony. And then, for the Snake Eyes Sean Collins rescue mission during the recent snake hunt event, Airborne was with the jump team that parachuted onto the roof. And that team fought their way down from the roof to the stairs and had a massive battle in the stairwell inside the Springfield Rec Center. And they ended up finding Sean Collins and they linked up with the ninja team and they battled their way out of the building. On the animated side, Airborne was voiced by Peter Cohen and he showed up quite a bit in the Sunbow animated series. He first appeared in that continuity with an episode called The Cobra Strikes, part one of the Mass Device miniseries. In fact, he was on the airfield when Major Blood attacked and targeted their parked Sky Strikers. In Cobra Soundwaves, Airborne was one of the Joes trying to protect an oil field from Cobra attack. The team fended off an attack, and as Airborne clutched his head, Lieutenant Falcon revealed that Airborne, according to his files, had ESP, Extrasensory Perception. And at the end of the episode, we see Airborne attack Cobra's sonic weapon from a Falcon glider. In Operation Mind Menace, Airborne was with a Flash and a Dragonfly trying to rescue a hostage on Rapa Nui. Flash was talking about how Cobra must have a base nearby, and that's why Cobra was trying to shake them and hold them off with their fangs. So Airborne said, and all this time I thought it was your breath. Then we learn that Airborne has a kid brother named Tommy, and Tommy had psionic powers. And then an agent says that the brothers could feel each other's thoughts. I guess they were the opposing force to the Crimson Twins in that regard. When Cobra shot down Airborne's chopper, Tommy freaked out, sensing his brother's danger. And Storm Shadow and Cobra broke in and kidnapped Tommy. Cobra also kidnapped Airborne because they wanted an army of living weapons. Maybe something akin to an evil version of the CIA's old Stargate project. Cobra forced Tommy to bring the Moai to life and the stone creatures attacked Airborne and Flash and the Moai almost knocked them off a cliff into the ocean but Duke and LJ showed up with Skyhawks to save them in just in time. After Cobra replaced the generals with synthoids and disbanded the team, Airborne was one of the Joes to rally to fight back. They stole some Sky Strikers and headed out to sea to stop Cobra and to rescue the generals. Airborne flew with Ace for this mission. He was also in G.I. Joe the movie, seen in the Ice Dome Assault right in an MBT Mauler. For once, he was in a ground vehicle. 
In early 1983, Airborne's first action figure was released, complete with tan and blue fatigues, his backpack, and an XM-16 attack rifle. Later that year, he was put into a JCPenney exclusive 3-pack along with Doc and Gung Ho, and he was also sold at mail-away offers like Operation Freedom and Get Your Gear. Airborne also made onto the box art for Wild Bill's XH-1 Dragonfly Assault Copter, shown right in the gunner seat, and he was part of the Original Adventure Team set in 1986. In 1990, there was another Airborne that was released as part of the Sky Patrol line, but that was Bob Six, not Mr. Tall Tree. 2003 Spy Troops Airborne was carded in a two-pack with a Televiper. In 2004, he was boxed with the Valor vs. Venom Sky Sweeper Jet. 2008 Airborne was part of the 25th Anniversary line, their Helicopter Assault Trooper. Then, another anomaly. 2009 Franklin Tall Tree was released with the name Air Raid instead of Airborne. He again came with the Sky Sweeper Jet as part of the Rise of Cobra line. In 2013, Franklin was again released with the codename Airborne. This time with Snake Eyes and Agent Mouse for a G.I. Joe Tactical Ninja Team set. And that's it, the story of Airborne. That's a wrap on this one, my friends. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, and you'll be one of the first to know when I upload videos just like this every single week. I'm Jesse, this is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.